Bob, Bob has uh, as many years of experience as a number of you know, I'm say how many years in the academic industry and government sectors. Um, he has a track, track record in developing and leading multidisciplinary research, advanced technology, product development teams. Uh, he's rec recognized as a strategist, as an innovator, as a leader. Uh, he's experienced in developing strategy, intellectual property management, building partnerships to achieve technological and business diversification. He's experienced in knowledge-based systems, modeling and simulation of complex networks, information exploitation. <laughs> and uh, an advanced information retrieval systems. Without further ado, Bob, Bob Del Zappo. Thanks, Seth, for that kind introduction. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this uh, research and technology uh, forum. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Tammy, and the group for uh, setting this up every uh, uh, third Tuesday uh, of the month. Please come and grab your friends and come. It's a it's a great uh, it's a great uh, program. Uh, I promise not to read too much today, you see, but you know, I try to memorize this, you know, which is kind of crazy. So I'm going to keep it kind of brief. I'm not gonna, I want you to know a little bit about our panel here. Uh, uh, the, uh, the topic, of course, is New Air, uh, a regional uh, alliance of private industry, academic institutions, and military assets and operations working together to establish a Federal Aviation Administration designated test site for unmanned uh, aircraft systems in the Northeast. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of things about the program today, generalities about uh, business opportunities, applications. You're going to hear some things, and I'm, I'm willing to bet most of you are not going to realize how many uh, commercial applications um, are out there and what this future uh, holds. Uh, but you're going to hear about things like sense and avoid and uh, applications in aerial imaging and agriculture and things like that. So I'm very pleased here to have uh, Andrea Bianchi from New Air, who's here. And next to her is Bob Alger from SRC. And uh, we're just going to read the order here. That sounds like okay. Yeah. Really. What's the chance of that? So Don McGowan from uh, RIT. And Ryan Luce from uh, Green Hockey. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, Andrea. Andrea uh, works to enhance the uh, local innovation ecosystem in central upstate New York through her work with Center State CEO that everybody here has heard uh, from. Uh, she's also a program manager for the New Air Alliance, a nonprofit consortium, which you'll hear about too, uh, focused on the development of unmanned aircraft systems for commercial purposes. Uh, the New Air Alliance operates UAS test ranges in New York and Massachusetts and is working to establish the Northeast U.S. as a center for the research, development, and commercialization of the technology. She's a Syracuse native, uh, Binghamton University graduate. She's uh, interested in enhancing the startup and entrepreneurial community in upstate New York. She's an organizer. She's done a lot of things for some of you. She's graduated a few years ago, if you don't mind these names. Organizer for Startup Weekend uh, in Syracuse and co-managing director for the Central New York Chapter of Girls in Technology, a global organization focused on education and empowerment of women in technology. Uh, so then we have uh, Bob Alger, uh, who I actually know quite well from SRC. Bob's been at SRC for uh, over 28 years, specializing in radar research and development. Uh, he has uh, led for the past several years now SRC's efforts related to UAS airspace integration. In his current role, he's a product account director for ground-based Sense and Avoid. Uh, he's responsible for new and existing business opportunities related to <coughs> safely integrating unmanned air systems into the national airspace system. He's got a degree in electrical engineering from uh, electrical engineering from Syracuse University. He's an active member of many organizations, much uh, too many to read here, but one of them that you want to note is the Sense and Avoid Science and Research Panel that's directed by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So Bob's one of those rare birds at SRC, you know, because he's very strong technically and he's got the business thing going on, so he's it's dangerous. Uh, and that, next to him we have Brian. Or, I'm sorry, Donald McCallum, uh, distinguished research and uh, researcher and project manager in the Digital Imaging and Remote Sensing Laboratory at RIT's Chester Carlson Center for Imaging Science. There he's focused on the development of new airborne imaging systems for research that include multispectral and infrared sensing. He's worked with the imaging science faculty to expand RIT's airborne sensing research and operations to include other spatially extended emergency applications such as earthquakes and flooding. Uh, 
He's got over 20 years experience at Eastman Kodak. He's a program manager and system engineer in the commercial and government systems division, where he was responsible for uh, development of high performance image, uh, imaging sensor hardware, now and currently in operation in uh, the Worldview and GOI commercial imaging satellites. And finally, Ryan, a uh, senior business executive uh, experienced in corporate management, mergers and acquisitions, finance, strategic planning, and growth strategy. So you can tell this guy's got a lot of the business and startup sense coming to the panel, which is great. Uh, he's held officer level positions in startup companies, mid market, and even market leading Fortune 200 organizations. He's the founder of Green Highway, which is a not for profit uh, corporation which exists to bring university researchers together with business and government partners to solve real world challenges in food, energy, water, and waste. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Luce is an active member and angel investor to early stage businesses through the Clean Tech Center and Technology Garden Incubators with projects in the Clean Tech, Med Tech, and ag agricultural and bio sectors. So we've got a pretty uh, diverse uh, panel here. Uh, they're going to all uh, take a few minutes, uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes, to tell you about their particular areas of interest and what they're working on. And uh, we will have time for Q&A uh, once, once they're finished. So I'm going to start off and uh, hand it over to Andre, who will uh, kick off and tell you a little bit about New Year. Thank you again for coming. So um, I'm Andrea Bianchi, and I am the Program Manager for the New Air Alliance. I um, just want to talk to you a little bit today about what New Air is and the work that we're doing with the um, Griffiths International Airport uh, test site for unmanned aircraft systems. You can take that. Okay. Perfect. All right, so we got a little bit of an introduction um, with uh, Bob's remarks at the beginning, but um, New Air is an alliance of about 40 organizations from New York and Massachusetts. Um, representing private industry, public entities, and academic institutions, um, working together to manage um, UAS test sites in both states. Um, and like I said, we are partnered with Griffiths International Airport to manage um, the test site operations of the Griffiths UAS test site. Um, so just some background on how New Air formed. We came about in response to the um, FAA Modernization and Reform Act of 2012. Um, this act mandated that the FAA start integrating unmanned aircraft systems into the nation's airspace by 2015 and uh, develop the rules for um, UAS to be used commercially in the United States. Um, the process actually officially began about a year later in February of 2013 when the FAA released their um, RFP, or uh, what they call the Screening Information Request, to um, allow bids from different public entities to um, host one of six of these test sites. Um, so at that time, we uh, officially teamed with Griffiths International Airport um, as the applicant had to be a public entity um, and submitted <coughs> a proposal to the FAA in about seven volumes between February and May of 2015. And then on December 30th, um, we found out that Griffiths International Airport was selected as one of just six of these test sites around the country. Um, and as I mentioned, the purpose of the test site system is to um, collect data uh, to give to the FAA and to develop the rules and regulations for um, unmanned aircraft systems to be used commercially in the US. Um, so I want to take a step back here and uh, just talk about what is a UAS and what is a UAV. You hear a lot of terms to refer to this technology. Um, most commonly, a lot of you probably know the technology as uh, drones. Um, also hear remotely piloted vehicle, remotely piloted <coughs> aircraft, unmanned aircraft. Um, so, so the terms that we, you'll commonly hear me use throughout this presentation and probably with our other speakers um, are UAV and UAS. And a UAV is an unmanned aerial vehicle. So this refers to any kind of vehicle that is either remotely piloted or um, flown autonomously. So it doesn't have a pilot on board. Um, and an unmanned aircraft system refers to not only that vehicle, but also the enabling technology that allows that vehicle to fly remotely. So the ground control station, controlling, communication links, and also all the um, other support technology or payloads, so things like sensors and cameras that can go onto uh, this vehicle. 
Uh, so it's really important that to, to just know that the term UAS doesn't necessarily only refer to an aircraft. It's really a, a whole technology system. And a lot of the innovation and a lot of the, uh, the work that's going to be done um, in the UAS industry is uh, more specific to the support technology and the payloads than it is to the aircraft. Um, so that takes me to a little quote here by um, Chris Anderson. A lot of you are probably familiar with Chris Anderson as being the uh, editor-in-chief, uh, or former editor-in-chief of Wired Magazine. He now um, is the founder of a company called 3D Robotics, and he also started up a website called DIYDrones.com, which is kind of a forum for the uh, drone and uh, UAS user community. Um, so this quote, remember the military created the internet, but the people colonized it and created the web for their own purposes. The amateur UAV community is hoping to do the same with drones, demilitarize and democratize them so they can find their full potential. Um, so that's just a really important quote that I think really uh, gets to the key of this technology. Um, many people and many of us in the U.S. really associate unmanned aircraft system technology with use for the military. But um, there's so much more, and there's a lot more work being done and a lot more applications that this technology just has amazing um, innovation potential. So just to give you some examples of uh, that type of innovation that's taking place in the other areas that um, UAS will use commercially, um, one of the biggest areas is precision agriculture. So this picture here is an RMAX um, unmanned helicopter made by Yamaha. It's actually been used in Japan for um, over 20 years to do crop spinning. Um, it's, there's a lot of uh, huge benefits to using an unmanned aircraft system such as this to do that kind of work um, on ag in agriculture. Um, one of the benefits is uh, cost savings. So um, you can spray pesticides or fertilizers and you can be much more precise with the application. So it, it reduces the total cost to the farmer. Um, another huge benefit is um, it reduces the environmental impacts. Um, currently, if there's aerial spraying going on, it's done by a helicopter. Wind uh, and other environmental conditions can carry uh, harmful pesticides to wildlife and, and people that are surrounding the farm. So using this technology really helps that application you know, stay right on the field where it needs to go. Um, another big area where we see this is public safety. Um, definitely has some great uh, great life-saving measures in search and rescue operations. Um, pictured here is a dragonfly in the UAS, and actually last year the Canadian government claimed their first life saved as a result of um, using a UAS for a search and rescue operation. Um, a man had been driving in a remote wooded area in Canada. His car flipped over, he was injured. Um, he wandered away from the accident scene, and a traditional search and rescue operation using a helicopter was deployed. They were unable to find him because the area was so wooded. They, they deployed some people on foot but were unable to locate him. So they deployed this small UAS with a camera attached that was able to um, actually find him alive and bring him to safety. So um, just life-saving potential there. Um, another huge area that this technology will be used in is accident investigation. Um, using a small unmanned aircraft like this to invest investigate fatal crashes really reduces the um, officer time that's spent at those scenes. It reduces the, uh, it, it's just a huge safety uh, boost to officer lives when there's a crash, you know, on a busy highway. Um, also helps uh, collect more um, correct forensic evidence for cases where there may be fatalities. Um, another area where this can be deployed is hostage and shooter response. Um, the FBI actually deployed an unmanned aircraft system um, about two years ago to respond to a hostage situation, I believe in Tennessee, where a young boy was taken hostage and held in a bunker by a um, man who was armed. So they were able to deploy um, an unmanned aircraft and find the shooter and uh, safely were able to get the boy out of that situation. So they were able to um, su successfully carry out a rescue operation without putting any officers in danger. Um, I also just want to me mention this group here. Um, this is a group of MIT and Harvard, Harvard Medical School students. Um, so they're developing a UAS that will deliver vaccines to um, remote areas. Uh, so they actually just won a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to continue their research. They're doing some testing um, with our partners in Massachusetts right now. So um, their unmanned aircraft will be able to um, carry medical supplies, vaccines, to clinics where um, people and aid workers are traditionally unable to go. So uh, once they continue their research, they'll hopefully be working with um, 
non governmental organizations and aid organizations to deploy their technology overseas. Another thing I just want to mention is uh, some of the innovation that's taking place with large tech companies. Um, I'm sure we've all heard about um, Amazon Prime Air and seen Jeff Bezos' uh, announcement on 60 Minutes a couple months back. So um, Amazon is obviously not a traditional aviation company, uh, but they're looking into using a small unmanned aircraft system for package delivery. So their whole goal with this project, as they say, is to uh, be able to make it so that customers can order a package and they can have that package deployed um, using a small UAS and delivered to their home in 30 minutes or less. Um, and another thing, Google actually just yesterday bought a um, small UAS startup called Titan Aerospace. Um, Facebook had actually been previously looking at this company and acquiring it. Um, so this is a uh, company that makes a large, uh, high altitude solar powered UAV. Uh, pictured here, it's called the Solera. So Google is interested in using this vehicle to um, bring broadband internet access <coughs> to parts of the world. That so just to uh, take a step back here and go back to how this all relates to the test site opportunity. Um, so the whole purpose of our test site is to integrate these technologies and these examples that you've seen before into um, our nation's airspace and to allow uh, commercial entities like Amazon, like Google, um, like the uh, manufacturers that make agricultural UAS um, to use them in our country. Um, so our data that will be collected from the test site and test site operations will be um, shared with the FAA, and they'll use that data to um, govern civil and commercial UAS activity. Um, so we will uh, allow uh, manufacturers, researchers, distributors to come to us and um, test their vehicles and uh, get them certified for use in the United States. And pictured here is um, a Dell Air Tech DT-18 UAS, which has been used by um, uh, a group called Flyterra in uh, France to do crop growth monitoring and fittings. And they're uh, a client that's expressed some interest in doing work at our test site, so maybe um, bringing that vehicle here to the U.S. So just want to talk a little bit about why New Air formed and why uh, Griffiths International Airport is really um, a good place for this kind of activity. Um, so we have a lot of UAS experience and um, uh, expertise here in New York State already. Um, the 174th Air National Guard Wing um, does all the training for um, MQ-9 Reaper operators and maintainers um, in their force and Air National Guard. So they actually fly right out of uh, Fort Drum and do some training operations above the Adirondacks. So the fact that we had that experience here in New York State is really critical to um, our application and to successfully bring the test site here to uh, New York State. Um, Joint Base Cape Cod, our partners in Massachusetts have some experience flying UAS um, out of uh, their area off of the coast of Cape Cod. Um, we also have the Air Force Research Labs Information Directorate. Um, they have a test site in Stockbridge, New York, about um, 23 miles southwest of Rome. Uh, which is one of the state-of-the-art facilities for um, small UAS testing, especially with um, radio frequencies and communication systems, which are really key to this whole project. Um, a tremendous amount of academic expertise, RIT, MIT, Cornell, Clarkson, Syracuse University. We have a very impressive um, academic roster involved with this project. And uh, I just want to draw your attention to the picture here. Cornell University students um, actually won first place um, in a uh, UAS build competition last year, so we already see some of that activity taking place at universities. And um, not to mention we have a uh, tremendous amount of private, private entity expertise with um, organizations like SRC, South Census, Health Department, um, a whole host of uh, cyber and IT firms in the land use area. <coughs> They're just uh, kind of a taste of some of our partners. So this was a very competitive process to become one of the six UAS test sites in the country. Um, this picture right here are all the states that had an entity submitting an application to compete for just one of these six test sites. Um, and then this map denotes the, uh, the entities that were actually awarded a test site. So in addition to New York State, we have a test site in Virginia, um, in Texas, in Alaska, in Nevada, and North Dakota. And, uh, it was such a competitive process. Test sites were not only chosen um, based on their climactic and uh, geographic diversity, as you can see at the 
uh, dispersed throughout the U.S. Um, so we have a wide range of uh, testing infrastructure uh, throughout the SIM test sites. But it was also a, an enormous economic impact uh, opportunity for all of the states that did a test site. Um, AUVSI, which is the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, um, they predict that the US UAS industry will create about 70,000 new jobs in the United States by 2017 and over 100,000 by 2025. Um, and New York State is really projected to um, grow exponentially because of uh, this industry as well. We're projected to be about ninth in the nation in terms of uh, job growth and economic impact. Um, so just in addition to the industry already bringing that impact to New York State, having a test site and um, allowing people to come here and test their products and be kind of the first market um, place in this industry uh, brings us additional jobs. So we're projected to create um, over 400 additional jobs by 2017 as a result of the test site. And uh, particularly in central New York, we have um, just a large concentration of assets here that um, really bring a lot of that job growth here locally. So in the rural Utica and Syracuse area, we're expecting to see over 300 new jobs created as a result of the test site being located here. And uh, just a <coughs> example of some of the work that might be uh, being done at the test site. We'll hear a little bit more from our other panelists, but I also wanted to draw your attention to a company called Mo, which is um, has a branch located in East Aurora in New York. Um, so Mo actually is doing some work with an option in pilot and helicopter right now. Um, their expertise is in um, aviation uh, control systems, particularly, and uh, they're looking to uh, tweak a vehicle that they have and make it um, an unmanned system that can be used for things like power line inspection, pipeline inspection, search and rescue, delivery, agriculture. Um, so that's just kind of an idea. This, this just shows the uh, parts that the they've developed to um, create an unmanned system. So Mo was actually um, speaking with a, uh, a facility in North Dakota to go and test their vehicle. But now that we have a test site right here in New York State, they're interested in keeping that testing local and um, keeping that job, those jobs and that investment right here in the state. So that's my contact information, just in case there's any questions after this. And of course, we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards. So thank you all for coming. And uh, I'd like to introduce Bob Alger from SRC. Thank you, Andrea. It has a very good background uh, tutorial on you. Uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, climactic diversity. I think today was a perfect example of yes. climactic <laughs> diversity in central New York. As uh, Bob mentioned earlier, my name is Bob Alger. I'm with SRC and I've um, been supporting airspace integration activities for uh, basically the DOD since uh, about 2008. I want to give you a little bit of um, information today, a little bit what I call just um, public awareness, help people sort of frame the work that's uh, related to UAS and how it differs amongst different platforms and what the requirements are for access to the airspace. And then uh, talk a little bit about some of the technologies that uh, revolve around that work. So for, for, the, for those of you who aren't familiar with Syracuse, or for SRC, we were originally founded by Syracuse University in 1957. It was originally called Syracuse University and Research Corporation. And uh, we were spun out of the university in the 1970s. And uh, since 1997, we've been in North Syracuse, um, just off of Path Row. And we also have a new subsidiary called SRC Tech, which is a for-profit subsidiary, which does some of our production work as well as our lifecycle management for the systems and vehicles. So 
But we're primarily a uh, R&D company, a not-for-profit, and most of the work we do is in academia. So this is the, the public awareness piece. I just wanted to talk a little bit about you know, what makes up UAS, the different categories of systems, and how the rules differ for various classes. So there's, it's mainly broken into four categories. There's the model aircraft, uh, the hobbyists, um, people you see out doing the flights on Saturdays, the little model aircraft playing clubs. As, uh, so you don't have to the top left picture there, you know, these things can be anything from a very small quadcopter to a something that might be, looks more like a miniaturized conventional airplane. And then there's the public and civil. Public is uh, generally the Department of Defense aircraft, so those are the ones you see in the news. Civil are first responders. They might be um, police departments, Department of Homeland Security, um, DHF, DHS, and organizations like that. And then fourth is commercial. So commercial is mainly what the, the group that we're attracting to you air. And the rules for those vary by the categories as well. Model aircraft, basically, um, as long as the hobbyist is not doing it for profit, the rules are not, those, his operations are not managed by the FAA. So he's basically allowed to fly up to 400 feet off the ground as long as he maintains sight of the, of the aircraft. Um, he's generally allowed to do that kind of stuff. But the key is he cannot do it for profit. So public and civil, those are both managed by the FAA. Those, those platforms have to adhere to the same rules that a general aviation pilot adheres to. So the main rule there is, is um, you'll see down here at the bottom, is Federal Aviation Regulation Section 91, Part 113, is the requirement to see and avoid other aircraft. That's the, the whole basis behind uh, flight. Pilot's responsibility is to be watching out the, the cockpit window, avoiding other traffic. That's the main challenge to integrating UAS in the national airspace, is that lack of the ability to see other aircraft in proximity to the UAS. So one of the solutions to those is an altered means of compliance for seeing a boy is to sense it. And I, I, I did skip one piece up there. The commercial regulations and rules for operation basically do not exist right now. So it, it is illegal to do commercial flights in the U.S. right now with the U.S. And that, so I'm, I'm sure you've been aware of the news. Um, Congress has been pushing hard for the FAA to help and put out what they call the small U.S. rule. Those are supposed to be the guidelines which allow commercial operation of U.S. in the national airspace. And uh, they were due to come out this year, but I think uh, the new date is uh, sometime earlier than 2015. Some of the technologies that uh, will allow us to do the sense and avoid piece are really broken into two parts. There's ground-based and then the airborne. The ground-based is uh, really what we like to call, it's an overused term, but the walk, crawl, run mentality to, to integration into the airspace. The three charts you see at the bottom are, are really the three stages of uh, airspace integration. One on the bottom left is the, uh, the line of sight operations. That's basically what the hobbyists are doing right now. So you can go out and you can operate as long as you can see your own aircraft and avoid other stuff around it, you'll be safe there. Terminal area operations is the next phase, and that's where you segregate really as opposed to integrate. What you're doing is, is really creating a volume around an airfield. You, you want to have sensors that tell you if something else is coming into that area, and you can either take evasive action or land an aircraft, whatever it takes to, to avoid collisions. And the third thing is, is really what everybody is, is trying to get to, the dynamic operations. That's where um, you'll have sensors on the ground, you'll have sensors in the air, but you're basically, instead of segregating an airspace, now you're integrating. You're creating a small volume around your own platform, which you want to keep void of other aircraft. So this little volume <coughs> follows you around as you fly, and you're sensing other aircraft as they approach you. 
So that's that's basically the, the incremental access strategy, and our tie-in and SRC into this is with our LSTAR air surveillance radar. We have a small 3D radar that's been adopted or adapted through software modifications to do the air surveillance aspects of it and provide situational awareness to the operator so that you can survey the airspace around and, and have that sense part of the sensor board. Lastly is the airborne sense of the void. I think this is this is basically the area where the most technology innovation is being going to occur. Um, Ground-based sense of the void, that's it's an area lots of people understand and great handle on it. People have been doing air surveillance systems with ground-based radar for for decades. Um, the only innovative part of that ground-based sense of the void system is the is the algorithms and software which allow it to do the collision avoidance piece. So what you do with the data, that's where the innovation is coming in ground-based sense of avoid. Airborne sense of avoid, on the other hand, is, uh, is really an area where size, weight, and power are driving innovation. So So as you, uh, as you talk about the UAS categories and the different airspace they operate in, you know, the, small, the small thing might only operate up to 400 feet. The medium-sized things, I'm not sure the RMAX on here, and the inscribe, that might be flying up to you know, some higher levels and a little farther away. But then the other system, we also mentioned, was the, the Titan system. That, that's planning to fly up to 60,000 feet. So it's going to have to take off from the airfield someplace, transition through the airspace with other commercial traffic to get up to 60,000 feet. Then once it's up there, it's, it's scheduled to, to stay up there for, for long periods of time. Where I was going with this was the, the different types of airspace are going to require different kinds of sensing to avoid the other aircraft. Whereas the, the smaller aircraft that are going to be working in, small, in close proximity to the operator or the pilot, they can, they can probably get away with ground-based sensor avoid or, or sensor avoid technologies that are pretty simple. When you start to get beyond line of sight or, or human true autonomous operations, that is where the airborne sensor avoid technologies are going to take over. So after you leave an airfield with a ground-based sensor avoid system, you're going to transition into some sort of airborne sensor avoid. And ultimately, ultimately lead towards a full autonomy. There's going to be a day when the crew is going to FedEx facility, load the packages on the plane, press a button, and the plane taxis out, takes off, and lands in all day. They don't know the packages, and they've got no pilot interaction at all. Now, to do sense and avoid, airborne sense and avoid, that's going to uh, ultimately talk about the full autonomous system, it's going to require all the sensors to be on the aircraft itself. So that's pretty easy to do if you're talking about something that's, you know, like Andrew mentioned, the uh, MQ-9 Reaper, that's a fairly large aircraft, it has a wingspan over 100 feet, can carry pretty large payloads. So you can afford size, weight, and power to put a fairly powerful radar in that system that can see other aircraft. If you start scaling that down through the classes to get to a small handheld quadcopter, you're not going to be able to carry a conventional radar system on that platform. So that's where the innovation is going to come in. What are the different technologies that are going to be developed to allow the small UAS to sense its environment and get towards a real cognitive type system, something that senses and adapts to the data that's coming into it? So that's where we, that'll lead to my summary. I think the, uh, you know, from, from our perspective, the small commercial UAS is going to drive innovation in the industry. That's, uh, they have the most incentive to, to fly uh, package delivery services. We've already seen Amazon's interest in, in that. They have a lot of money to, to do that type of development work. And uh, 
New Air and with the with their work closely with uh, with the FAA is going to uh, help develop the regulations and policies that uh, let us do this safely. And with that, I'm going to get the next speaker and we'll come up here for questions afterwards. And one thing I did just want to tail on to uh, Bob's presentation, I forgot to mention that um, each test site has a research focus, um, and our research focus here in New York State is sensitive oil. So having companies like SRC and Subsensus that have already developed that technology and have uh, real expertise in that area um, it is really key to the kind of work that we're going to be developing here. Okay. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction to the idea and this uh, discussion about on sort of laying the groundwork uh, describing the UAS system. Um, what I'm going to talk about is from the perspective Imaging science at RIT and how we view uh, the emerging UAS uh, opportunities. And uh, within our department, we're sort of technology imaging nerds. And to a certain extent, we're sort of platform and application agnostic in terms of where the te technology goes. We see the we see the problem as somebody says, I want to see a certain thing under a certain set of conditions with certain constraints. And figure out how to do that. And that's that's kind of what we do. But we see uh, UAS platforms as, as a really interesting opportunity to take some of that imaging technology and do some interesting things related to it. First of all, with, with UAS platforms, especially in contrast to manned systems, we have the possibility of really rapid deployment because these systems are sweet, relatively small, Lightweight, cheap. Um, you know, you've seen uh, cases where uh, police officer, for example, could have a UAV in the trunk of the patrol car and tell they had an accident site of this uh, heavy weight that never been before. We have the possibility of persistence because, um, especially with uh, a slow moving or a fixed wing or, or these little quadcopters, they can hang around in the area uh, much easier than a, a manned aircraft that has to maintain a certain amount of airspeed. Out around the area. Um, these, these things can hang around. And again, relatively low cost. The cost of these things, thanks to the hobbyists, are just dropping tremendously. Technology that's available uh, from Amazon or DIY or whatever 20 years ago would have been millions of dollars. And, you know, for, for a couple hundred dollars, you can get something that's really fairly capable and, and with what I call meaningful payload and endurance. I'm not talking about something that will lift half an ounce for, for 20 minutes, but something that will carry several pounds of payload for, for from tens, many tens of minutes to, to many hours. And that to a, an imaging technology person, that's meaningful. That can come up with sensors and processing electronics that can take advantage of. And we're looking at payloads, sensors that go beyond simple video that, that we're used to seeing, uh, going beyond the visible and going into the infrared, uh, looking at multispectral or hyperspectral, or things that are not literal imaging, things like LIDAR, where you're using uh, laser pulses to create 3D images of, of areas. And again, to make the, the information or the imagery more useful, we're putting all of this stuff into a geospatial context, being able to you rectify or align all of these images to a map so somebody can actually look at it and they can immediately know what they're looking at and where it is. And also, of course, not just looking down, but imaging technologies to assist the scene have more of a problem. So just like the, the pilot is using his eyeballs to look around, uh, the imaging technologies can do the same thing. So at RIT, as a, yeah, again, we're sort of platform and application agnostic. We didn't really, we take the challenge of somebody that will come along and say, I need to see this from a satellite or an aircraft. What do I need to do to make that happen? And, um, and so that involves development and testing of various types of exploitation algorithms. A lot of it dealing with spectral properties of targets and looking at the physics and the phenomenology 
of, uh, of a scene, how the sun interacts with the target, how the atmosphere interacts with that. And you guys are looking at multiple hyperspectral impact with these two. We also are going beyond uh, reflective types of imaging into emissive or thermal infrared type uh, applications. There's a lot of things that become apparent when you're looking in the thermal infrared, but there's just no way you can see that uh, with uh, reflective uh, technologies. And then how do you combine what we call multimodal data? So you have data from a, from a uh, high resolution color camera. How do I combine that with LIDAR? How do I combine that with hyperspectral or infrared data so that I can bring together a, <coughs> a more comprehensive set of information from individual technology types? And all of this involving advanced mathematical techniques and hardware. So what we see in terms of from a imaging science uh, hardware imaging system implementation perspective, uh, one of the things of in investigations that we are interested in with regard to UASs, first of all, is the requirements. What kind of resolution do you need to have for the kind of mission that you're trying to execute? Coverage rate, am I trying to, am I looking at just a, a parking lot or am I looking at, at a forest fire that's covering tens of thousands of acres? And how well do I need to geolocate? How well do I need to know the location of every object in the, in the image? What are the available sensor systems that fit within the size, weight, and power that strains the bot talked about? And cost is huge. In every system that I've ever looked at, people talk about the technology and the capabilities, but ultimately it all boils down to how much does it cost? And what other kinds of supporting technologies out there? Inertial navigation systems. This is a this goes a long way to determining the geolocation accuracy of these systems, as well as not just navigating the system, but also helps me to know when I take an image where, where on the Earth that image is. And how do I take the data off of the sensor system, either record it or send it to the ground, and it brings cost. See cost keeps appearing. Um, and then what are the available platforms? They're big, they're small, but all of them are ultimately constrained by how much payload they can carry. So, so what kind of imaging capability can you fit within that, within those constraints? What kind of flight performance does the system have? Uh, can it stop and hover and stare at a spot? Or is it like a, like a quadcopter? Does it have to be constantly moving like a first wing uh, aircraft? Operability, of course. Cost. And then, then the operating constraints imposed by the FAA, all of these things add together in terms of determining what kind of imaging solution, technology solution you can offer to the system. So just a couple quick uh, examples that uh, we've been looking at. One of my um, collaborators at RIT, John Van Arden, a forester, he does a lot of work with uh, spectral signatures from uh, vegetation. So can you do uh, spectral assessment of vineyard moisture stress? And so he's been looking at uh, taking spectral signatures and using that to infer the condition of, of crops in, vine in this particular case, a vineyard. So you don't have to have somebody ride around on a four-wheeler or walk around a vineyard, but you know, very quickly grab some multispectral imagery or hyperspectral imagery and assess the condition of the, of the high vineyard. You can also use uh, spectral content and imagery to identify early emergence of, of various infections that might be uh, attacking a crop. So you, can, so you can get to it and then address it with another uh, UAS, like a helicopter, that come in and spray a particular infected area. That way you minimize the amount of, of chemicals you have to utilize in that, in that case. And then yield prediction. Using mathematical algorithms, you can take a, a, a pixel that has um, a big spectral distribution in it and actually isolate, isolate how much of that 
spectral content of that pixel is from a particular item that you're looking for. So in this case, we determine, you can look at a uh, hyperspectral image of, a, of an orchard and make an estimate of how many oranges are in the tree. Now, another area is uh, rapid response uh, to airborne imagery, imagery, and that's, a, of course, a big area for the clinical area for the devices. So, uh, so um, what I'm going to do is show you some examples of what we've gathered from manned aircraft uh, uh, deployments to show you, to show you some uh, of what's possible when coming to that. Now, at RIT, we have supported local, state, and federal agencies in some of our research around applying imagery to particular response scenarios. We do a lot of work with the Forest Service in wildfire response. We're looking at how does a wildfire behave by flying over the, the fire for, for a long time and watching it through the thermal and uh, regular visual imagery. We've been supporting the Monroe County Office of Emergency <coughs> Management with exercises related to the like an A nuclear power plant in a neighboring uh, county, and, uh, and using uh, airborne imagery to assess evacuation routes in the near real plane to, to identify bottlenecks, things like that. And then uh, we've also supported uh, New York State DHSES with uh, very short turnaround uh, imagery of uh, floods in Binghamton uh, from. Uh, Tropical Storm Lee, and on around Plattsburgh with uh, Hurricane Irene. We also supported them with uh, some satellite imagery analysis for nuclear exercise. Uh, now, as part of all this, we had developed uh, under under NASA sponsorship an airborne system that uh, collects imagery and in real time processes that processes that imagery to geolocate it. So that adjustable into a, a map system, and then sends that imagery via downlink to the ground, and then for dissemination to the user. And um, we see this as the same, same type of architecture that you would apply for a UAS. So the real uh, uh, technology challenge is how do you take this kind of, of uh, technology and capability from a, a 200 or 300 pound system shrink it down to something that would fly on flight. So the notional operational architecture, Monroe County would have a data fusion center where they need information. We would deploy a, uh, a UAS uh, ground control station that would then send commands up to a UAS aircraft. And I really like the, the distinction Andrea made between UAV and UAS. I didn't, hadn't known about that until I came here, and that's a, that's a very good distinction. That, that the system is more than the, than the aircraft platform itself. So, the, uh, so Monroe County says, I need some information on what's going on. Um, go to this uh, ground station, send commands to the aircraft, which operates the camera to get me some real time imagery of what's going on on the expressway. The imagery comes back down to the UAS ground control station. It then goes through an image data processor, which would decompress the image, align the imagery to uh, the geographic coordinate systems, and send that imagery via a landline or, in the case of Monroe County, their own RF network to the fusion center where they can then view it. So just a couple of quick examples. These are from actual RIT deployments in Haiti. Uh, this is the uh, National Palace in Haiti right after the earthquake. And because we were operating a multimodality system, so remember I mentioned how do you combine different sensor uh, information together, we were flying LIDAR, which collects 3D information and, and combines with the, with the uh, imagery so that the image Obviously, you can tell the building is messed up. With LIDAR, you can actually make quantitative measurements of how things have moved in biomass. In this case, there was a, uh, some apparent damage on a, basically, where a tanker would offload here to a 
oil storage facility, and it looked like there was something going on here. The visible imagery you see in the long way into red, <coughs> that there's, a, there's actually a plume of oil leaking off of that area. Uh, this is from the Tropical Storm Lee. This is an area in uh, Johnson City. That's the DAE plant. And you can see that there's some you know, nastiness going on there. And again, the, and, and the resolution is very high. And what enables us to do that, again, to do this with the UAS, is you're capturing multiple frames, as you can see in here. And then because I'm geo-referencing things, geolocating it, I can take all these frames and stitch them all together into one big frame, which I can blow up to very high resolution and see details in what's going on. Hurricane Irene in Fatsville. This is a reference ortho from New York, from New York State. Seen sort of the before and the after of damage to that uh, event. Just very detailed. And then again, Tropical Storm Lee and uh, Binghamton, we actually flew that flood and we actually caught a fire on the interstate north of uh, Binghamton. And you can see that there's obviously a fire here. And if I look at the simultaneous flashing in the thermal infrared, because thermal infrared is not uh, impacted by smoke. I can see not just the location of the fire, but these other vehicles here, and I have trouble seeing the uh, smoke uh, obscurations. Now, in this case, a wildfire. Then, uh, up the where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, here's the high resolution color image of the fire, the simultaneous imagery from the shortwave infrared, and you actually punch right through the smoke and see the fire front itself. So, <coughs> the point of all of this is to show what is possible with uh, technology that can be migrated, I believe, fairly easily into UASs. I think the cost of these technologies is, is just dropping tremendously year by year or month by month. So I think it offers some really exciting possibilities in uh, agriculture, emergency response, infrastructure monitoring, all of those things that require this, uh, this kind of information. So that's all I have. exist to unite industry and, and academia in a way that fosters better commercialization of the research that's done. So in simple words, you can think of us as an SRC, as an R&D center, but we're more the D and less the R. We have some amazing university partners that do a lot of great research, and we're here to help them develop their research into more commercially viable products. So we focus, to a certain degree, on energy, food, water, waste, and obviously the key driver in uh, the changes that are happening in the South so when you normally think of agriculture, you wouldn't normally think of infrared sensing and uh, unfamiliar vehicles and precision agriculture. What is that? How do you define that? So um, technology really is what is what's the driving force between what we're doing at the Earth Foundation and Green Highway and what's happening to the Green Center. And the global challenges surrounding food, water, waste, and energy, uh, it's a global thing. So we've solved some of those problems and a lot of the research that's happening at the universities surrounding our region, uh, it's globally significant. And we're here to unite industry and academia in a way that uh, helps solve some of these challenges. So our methodology is relatively simple. As an R&D developer, more as a developer of research, um, we're here to connect, uh, connect the global industry partners and global academia uh, to our region as well. Uh, we're here to obviously germinate, and we say germinate versus uh, innovate or accelerate because we're taking ideas and creating them into commercially viable products. We're here to take, go from that gap of ideation to creation to commercialization and help to, uh, drive more sponsored research from our university partners <coughs> and create more commercially viable products and companies. 
Obviously, that leads to business development, leads to deal flow, leads to building more collaborations and hopefully more businesses, and uh, bringing the world to our door so that they realize that we have the most smart stuff. So that's the Oakwood View and Green Highway. We got involved in UAV because we were speaking with our IT as part of our university collaborative group. And uh, obviously, agricultural, from a global standpoint, URVs are used 80% in agricultural purposes. So you notice the Yamaha RMAX, which is pretty much the more popular one to use on a larger scale. And that's used a lot for, in Japan, obviously, for spraying. So if you think about, there's a big difference between Japanese agricultural and their practices, step terraces, small confined areas, versus um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres of farmland in Iowa. So we are a small UAV probably would be applicable to uh, spraying pesticides, herbicides on uh, a couple hundred acres or thousands of acres of cornfield would be very <coughs> useful in very specific circumstances. So uh, these are um, just some images of the different types of uh, gyroscopic hopper here, a hand launch uh, UAV here, and obviously the RMAX, which is used for a different payload to be processed. So when we look at UAVs from our standpoint and in our collaboration with New Air, it is there's some great technologies, but what is it going to do? And what does the market need it to do? Um, and does the market need it to do anything here? So is this applicable to what businesses around our area and our region and the United States and Canada, uh, would they be interested in this technology and how can we adapt what's being used elsewhere to our economic so the current uses in agriculture for UAVs right now are spraying, seeding, remote sensing, cross mitigation, mapping, contour mapping, topographic mapping, aerial surveys. So imaging and real simple uh, you know, spraying, seeding, real straightforward. Um, what could they be used for? What, uh, what are the market ramifications? So is it also, can we use it for fire? So can we also use it to count uh, crop, we can use it to count oranges, we can use it to count apples. So what are the other uses of UAVs in agriculture and how could they be uh, cataloged and then how can we connect them with our industry partners in the region and then how can we take that to market and utilizing the technologies we develop with the uh, OEMs and then bringing new products and new capabilities to go along with that. And if we are doing simultaneous testing in our region, it would make sense to bring uh, industry partners and new technologies to test with the current UAV uh, testing that we have in our area. So how can we then make those connections and bring together industry partners and academic partners to create new, uh, new products and new services for this site? So potential precision applications, this is more along the lines of the oils. So <coughs> we just talked about, uh, John just talked about multi-spectral aerial imaging. So, can we determine invasive species coming in? So can this be done from a forestry standpoint? Can this be done from a field standpoint? Um, can we look at plant health based on spectral analysis as well too? Um, variations in, in the product and how is the yield going to be? Uh, those of you who have never heard of the Chicago Board of Exchange and understand that commodities are traded like stocks are traded, the information that is happening relative to our agricultural commodities are very important. Well, too, but a lot of money rests on that. So, can we have better real time information utilizing the sense systems through UAVs to monitor our crop output? Um, we've all heard about this uh, uh, state called California and the fact that they have a big drought. So, moisture conditions. Um, what's happening with uh, do we need very specific uh, precision agriculture? Can we, so can we specifically irrigate one area and not another area? Can we specifically put pesticides, herbicides? or other media on our soil or our plants to help them grow in an area that needs it versus an area that doesn't need it. Um, when you think about agriculture, you normally don't think about sensors. You know, the types of sensors that are out there that can also utilize uh, the imaging, but also moisture content, and also communicate with a data system so that when the UAV is out in the field doing uh, analytics, it's then going back into something else. So. Um, those of you who grew up on a farm, I mean, this now is becoming your, your greatest farm tool, is your cell phone. 
So what information could be partnered with the uh, UAVs now to bring real-time data that can be utilized to help make more money? So these are questions that we have. Um, and we're doing research that is integral on UAVs. We're doing sensors. So now if we can put together all the packages, now we have something that is more commercially viable to our area. So how can we better do that? So these are questions that we're asking and we're going out to the market to see what is the market like. So real-time crop output analysts would be very interesting. Inset mapping. So we have already has gone through the Adirondacks and seen these little blue boxes hanging from the trees. So we have, um, you know, we know elm disease and we've, we've seen pests move in different areas that are affected. So instead of spraying mosquitoes in the whole Cicero swamp, can we just spray one area instead of the whole swamp? So do we know, can we have sensors that know where insects are moving to that can be destructive to crops? Um, again, flood, water, soil, fire, geological monitoring. I just spoke about that very, very simply. So these are the what ifs. Um, what is possible uh, with UAVs? What could they be used for? What does the market need or want or what could be the marketplace based on uh, what our farming dynamics are, our agricultural dynamics are? So that's what we're out to find out with some great some good industry partners that are not normal industry partners. So how can we get the data people, the Google people involved and create data analytics that can help uh, agricultural production? So real-time crop, real crop monitoring would be very interesting so that we know whether if you're going to hedge on your soy, you're going to hedge on your corn, you'd actually have more real-time information to utilize this. Robotic and or GPS uh, controlled uh, UAVs. Um, anybody knows anything about uh, China and Eurasia? There's some soil issues, there's water pollution, there's air pollution. Um, most people don't know that the USDA is doing a really good job throughout the United States. You actually can go to most parts of the United States and pull up a soil map and actually find the contents of soil somewhere. Um, that's not happening around the rest of the world. So if we're going to mitigate, could we have a, a UAV that remotely goes up and samples soil or samples water or samples biologics to find out what they're carrying, what they're diseased, and if there are issues that need to be mitigated. So this is the what if. What could be done based on uh, some issues and challenges surrounding the environmental issues that UAVs could uh, work with? So um, that's what we are about uh, Green Highway to solve challenges and problems surrounding ag, uh, agricultural and biological uh, sectors, food, water, waste, and energy. So for us, our neighbors next door in Canada um, have been using UAVs for a while. And when we first started uh, speaking with um, earlier about what we were doing, it's like, well, what's out there? Well, who's using it? Let's go talk to them. Let's find out what the market wants. So um, we started doing some small sampling. We spoke with a group called the Soil Stewardship Group at the Nile Canada Laboratories out of Ontario, Canada. And they've been using UAVs, I believe, since 2009. Um, and it goes to the cost of energy. So what they've been buying on the commercial market, uh, the sensors and the software, is not workable for what they would like to use. So now they've got to actually create their own UAV. They've created their own sensors, and now they have to do their own programming because what's available on the market isn't fitting the needs that they want for their marketplace. So that's the market saying, here's a need. How can we fill it? So very anecdotally, it says that there's a lot of room for improvement with what's on the market because if it was designed for a different area or a different region, it may not be applicable to our area. So there's opportunity. And where there's a challenge, there's an opportunity. So now, how can we partner to create the right platform, be it hardware and software, to meet the need of the market? And that's also the Green Highway mission. So that's why one of the reasons why we became involved with Green Highway. Okay? And that's the end of my presentation. panel uh, very much uh, for their time today and uh, it looks like we have some time here for questions who's uh, helping with uh, uh, time here uh, okay a few, well, a few minutes at least 10 minutes right so uh, mm -hmm. first question yes, sir uh, the 82 billion I believe that was uh, in the first presentation any idea where those uh, economic impact numbers 
they're broken down into, where do they expect these ones to connect to uh, focus most of the energy? In what industries? Yes. Um, so this is from a study by an organization called AUVSI, and it's actually available on their website, AUVSI.org. Um, study came out last year. So they found the most economic impact would be in um, the agricultural industry and in public safety. Um, those each would be uh, almost 50% of the market. Yes, sir. Following 9 11, our online access to a lot of TV and industry was extremely limited due to security concerns. So, if you have open source LiDAR flying around all over the place, what sort of security, how, how is that going to be dealt with? Um, I, I question. So, did everybody hear the question? This is an information security problem on, on uh, UAVs. Yeah, I, I can speak to it a little bit. Um, there's a lot of issues like that. Um, how do you control how the information collected from the AS is used? Uh, how do you form new regulations to deal with uh, this new technology? Um, that's that's all part of the uh, the issues that this this test site program is uh, starting to solve. So there aren't. Um, I mean, there are regulations in place right now for data retention and, and what what needs to be made publicly available and by whom and for how long. Um, so those same re regulations will be followed, uh, but a lot of the testing that we're going to be doing here and the data that we're going to be collecting um, through our test site will kind of inform those regulations as, uh, as work progresses. I don't know if there's anything uh, that John could add to that. Uh, I would say that the one of the big challenges with, with uh, high resolution data is probably licensing. You'll find that the, the USPS uh, uh, repository of data has, I think, uh, a pretty good collection of all the high resolution data that's been available by the states. But a lot of the restrictions they put on it are, like, for example, the photometry that you're familiar with it is uh, controlled by licensing. So they're, they're, there's, there's limitations on what they can share just by virtue of, of how the data is being licensed. That's going to be one of the challenges going forward as we get more and more of this data. Is how do you how do you make it available so that you can collect it all? I have another. Um, the uh, if I had a magic defense department catalog that had all of the, uh, the technology that's been developed for uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, would I be able to assemble this stuff? In other words, is one of our challenges really buying leads from the defense industry, those things that would help develop this industry? I can answer this a little bit. I mean, I'm from Ohio. Um, we, one of our uh, businesses reached out to the Army Laboratories in uh, Maryland, and they actually just came up with an emerging cannabis institute uh, where they're actually looking at sharing some of the technology that they developed with the Navy that has a lot of cross-site importance. And uh, obviously it does, because utilizing the same components separation becomes with the software. It's the integration of, you can sense anything, but then the interpretation and, and analytics behind on the software side becomes really, really specialized for agriculture and uh, with some very specific things. So we have a combination of different sensing components. But they're, um, in, in that initiative, the Open Campus Initiative, they're looking to share some of their technologies across different platforms uh, for different users. So um, they're opening up for that. Uh, it ties into the UAV sector. If I could speak to the imaging technologies uh, part of that, I would say that the, the advantage there, technology-wise, is with the commercial side. It's much more agile than the government. Like they, they're light years ahead in terms of, of the development cycle uh, and cost, again, uh, is way, way ahead. I think the paradigm where, where again, speaking from imaging, where in the 60s and the 70s, the government and NASA and the space program breaking new ground, and that's completely changed. And now you're looking at government programs that are actually looking at how can I leverage commercial off the shelf to get that information. And so, I think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 
OS, special <laughs> images. Uh, your cell phone has a much higher imaging capability on it than a lot of the other military systems. And it's just in the balance of the site. It's just so short. I, I, I would add to that, too. I don't know if you're aware. You may, may, were you at Rome a few weeks back when they were talking about uh, technology <laughs> transfer? And, there's actually a move on now. Um, the Secretary of Defense has a big move on now to push more out. Uh, so there's uh, there's programs now that we've never even seen before. They have a lot behind them, uh, and the government has not. They they speaking for them shouldn't be speaking for them, but they have recognized that they can't do it by themselves. That they don't know the commercial space. So they've partnered with the right people. A lot of really good people that are helping them. And, uh, the Air Force Research Lab is one of the sites that's heavily involved, and they're already working with entrepreneurs and groups and starting to identify key technologies that normally, you know, are going to just sit there mm -hmm. uh, for one reason or another. And even some of the stuff that's uh, closely held, they're, they're looking at it with, with an eye on it to say what, if anything, could help uh, revitalize. And, it's, and it all comes to economic impact. So the time is good for things to shake out. I can, I can say that. You'll see there, there is a new model coming. You guys see evidence of it. Um, in situ corporations, a subsidiary of Boeing is making money now with what they call pay for service. So instead of having DOD develop a sensor that they're going to put on a platform, they're just paying for hours of service from in situ for security surveillance. And then that's just to overcome the, the long development cycles. Of Yes, sir. How are we doing as a region relative to apparently being an economic hotbed? Um, how are we doing with the uh, public you know, sector subsidy to, to uh, reduce um, private sector development from an economic perspective? And are we doing well competitively regionally compared to the rest of the country? How, how do, how do uh, yeah, what's happening um, locally? In terms of the test site program, New York State uh, was the only test site um, that was chosen by the FAA that did not get any um, state money to go after this opportunity. Um, a lot of the other test sites had, had some kind of buy-in from the state to, to prepare their application and to um, just help them get a leg up to host one of these test sites. Um, since we have been designated, we do have um, some, uh, some state money coming our way uh, to help spur this development which will really be key in, in getting things off the ground and uh, just allowing this to develop as, as a business and as things go on. Um, but as of right now, uh, we started this project as anywhere and started this test site project um, strictly with the help of our academic and industry partners. Ed? Curious about the, uh, the policy, so what I understood was uh, the restriction is on commercial use of, of UAVs. If, if I'm a farmer and I go out and buy one of these uh, helicopters and, and I fly it for my own crops, is that in bounds with the current policy? Yeah, that or technically right now that's illegal. Um, that's, so that's illegal? Yes. That's legal. It's against the law. If I own the helicopter and I, I fly it over my property. Yeah. So, um, so just to make a distinction, it's legal to fly a UAS as a hobbyist. And there's some restrictions that go along with hobby use. You know, you have to be able to see the aircraft that you're flying at all times. You can't fly around <laughs> an airport. Um, but uh, you cannot fly any unmanned aircraft and make money off it, quite simply. Okay. And it's, it's really, it's kind of a gray area of the law. There, the law. There's been a lot of cases in which um, people have done this, and, and now the FAA is starting to crack down a little bit. Um, there was actually a recent decision, if you Google Perker decision, P-I-R-K-E-R, -E um, a photographer was using an unmanned aircraft to take pictures and was making them publicly available. He was um, actually sued by the FAA for doing this, or fined, I should say. Um, so this case actually went up to a federal court, and a federal judge ruled that um, since there are no regulations put out by the FAA, they just say this is illegal, that um, this person was not uh, guilty of breaking any laws. Um, that being said, so that, that kind of uh, goes against what the FAA is trying to say, but the FAA has appealed that decision, 
and they can still pursue legal action against um, individuals or entities that do use an unmanned aircraft for commercial purposes. Um, but right now, it's it's technically not legal to do so. Right. Um, so there's there's well, sorry, go ahead. Just think about the commercial purposes. I'm the farmer. I mean, I I own the, the aircraft and I own the field and I fly it myself and I don't charge anybody for anything. How how is that a commercial activity? Because it's that's that's where the gray area comes right. in. Because you are using it in um, helping to grow your crops and then selling those crops, that can be considered a commercial use. And then the same <laughs> issue is happening with uh, there's a lot of gray on that one. Yeah. yeah, the same issue has happened with um, a lot of universities using an unmanned aircraft for their journalism programs. Um, because they are uh, they're using images or video captured from an unmanned aircraft and making them publicly available. Um, a lot of those universities have been told to cease and desist, and, and news organizations have done the same thing. So it's um, it's interesting what's what is commercial use and what isn't commercial use. So I, I have a follow-on question. Uh, good to see uh, colleagues and friends on the on the hotline. I'm going to have one in a second. But if we instead of imagining going being the kind of outdoors where it's definitely illegal, and instead of just over there in that space and raising one of the helicopters that's indoor, is there any restriction on indoor <laughs> use? No, no, no. Good, good no question. indoor use. What's that? Indoor use. Okay. <laughs> there are some big chairs. No. <laughs> I have seen the quadcopter inside the Destiny flight. Yeah. yeah, I'm serious yeah. about that. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, 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 I'm. Yes, sir. I have a question more on the, the legal side, which is probably a little more beyond the scope of this, but there already are laws on the books regarding trespassing and ownership. We all own homes. We have something called fee simple ownership of property. We own technically it's below it. And it's trespassing to be above your property. How will that play into it eventually when UPS wants to deliver a package to my neighbor and flies a couple hundred feet over my property? Isn't that trespassing? It's legal. It is. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's very interesting and to be determined. Um, and that's uh, like I said, going back to the test site program. These legal issues are um, things that the test site will kind of help the FAA figure out. And some of those issues um, are beyond the scope of the FAA. So other agencies like DOJ, for example, need to kind of make a ruling and, and create regulations on, on those types of uh, situations. OK. Uh, oh, wait, wait, another question. Yeah, I've got to give like, the challenge thing. So uh, yeah. it was uh, somebody in the room probably could speak help, help me. Uh, Explain it was like about 20 years ago for field research in the Adirondacks. Um, researchers needed to collect leaves from the upper part of the trees. Uh, so the established uh, protocol for uh, for taking samples of leaves from the upper part of trees was to, was to use an instrument of a shotgun. So actually, we, we, we purchased at the university. Imagine using a risk management thing. Uh, to go yeah. buy, buy a shotgun and buy shells and send graduate students out to the field and harvest leaves. So actually, this is this is a environmental application problem for the UAVs. That you know, give, give me the helicopter with a claw that I can fly to the upper part and collect some leaves and bring it down without, without requiring a shotgun. So if shotguns are okay, it's the university's problem. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all. I just uh, if you need like another challenge application. <laughs> uh, we still have time. Yeah, one last one. Yeah. So somebody in the audience has a neat idea and they want to go talk it over. Who should they start with? Like they, they, this has inspired them, or later they find something out. Who should they? Who would be a great person to start talking to? Start by reaching out to Newer. I mean, we have partnerships with um, all of these industry and academic partners. Um, we've been contacted by clients who are wishing to do testing and, and looking for others to kind of help um, add to their ideas or, or uh, help them do whatever type of testing they need to do. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out to me uh, to kind of figure out how Newer can make work with your idea or your organization. And um, if there's a tie in with any of the test site activity, 
quite a bit online too. If you're if you're interested in the rules and regulations that govern how you can fly, there's uh, the AMDSI.org with aviation, and also the FAA website has a uh, a roadmap on how to uh, get access to the <coughs> you know, field flights when you want to access the airspace. Is Big Daddy um, immune from Big Daddy being of course government immune from same restrictions as uh, anything else in the utilization of, of um, drones. Good question. Well, currently, as the current uh, regulations stand, right now a public entity, um, so meaning a, a branch of government, is the um, are the only entities that can get permission to fly a UAS. Um, so they, in, in doing so, they still have to go through a process. They still have to apply, they still have to be very specific as to where the flight is taking place, what kind of vehicle are they flying, what kind of um, safety or environmental um, uh, things need to be taken into account. Um, so currently, the, uh, the government does need to go work with the FAA and go through an application process, um, which is called a certificate of authorization, um, in order to, to get permission to fly it on that aircraft. Um, so, you're seeing some uh, some issues with the current uh, system. Um, one example that I can think of off the top of my head, the, um, the Air National Guard is able to um, obtain a pellet to fly um, certain unmanned aircraft uh, for training purposes. And um, they can also deploy these unmanned aircraft for emergency response situations. Um, because the application as it currently stands is uh, very, takes a long time to get approved, um, this was kind of a hindrance in Using unmanned aircraft in uh, emergency situations, um, in with with recent um, Hurricane Sandy in uh, New York State, and during Air National Guard, um, was trying to deploy unmanned aircraft to kind of do some disaster assessment and rescue operations, but were unable to do so because of the operation. So um, the the federal government, I guess, a long answer to a short question, um, is still subject to oversight and still subject to um, going through a process. In distinction between a commercial product from a manned aircraft and an unmanned. There's a question about Crocky. Well, we're all on Google. Google got that somewhere. It seems to happily sell it to whomever. You mentioned pictography, which kind of leads to another one of my other jobs I've had in other county. They have these flight patterns and pictography, and that was that's all commercially available. We don't seem to retain any rights for our property on that. So what Where's this line between what you can do apparently in a commercial aircraft, take a picture of anything, if you can get the right optics or the right hardware, but an unmanned aircraft is often this never, never land, is don't touch, don't tell, don't do. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point to make. Why, how, what's the difference? Yeah, we are, we are collecting the same data, and it's the same, um, essentially the same technology. The only thing we've changed is where um, the pilot is, because you know, they're on the ground instead of being on the, in the aircraft. Um, and that's interesting, and I think I, uh, a lot of the uh, policy implications that come from using the UAS for these purposes that manned aircraft are already used for is uh, that it is a lot cheaper to use and a lot more accessible to more people. So it is um, just subject to different types of regulation. I wonder why. So, I mean, yeah. you have a warm body, you're good. If you don't have a warm body, you're not good. Yeah. But you need a license to fly a plane. You don't need a license yeah. to use it. Yeah, exactly. Good point. But, but how's that well, right different now, the product than yeah. having that physical thing in the air? Whether it's licensed because you you had you have the difficulties imposed by a human form, and you're licensed because of the imperfections of the human form. I think, you know, why why the complexity become a pile? You have to have a certain skill set, presumably. Why is the imposition of that skill set a skill set in a physical entity up in the air give you the right to turn out a product that a physical entity in the air without that troublesome skill set? Doesn't have. I think, I think I, that's a rhetorical way. question. I'm not looking for an answer. In the end, what you'll see is a lot of uh, there's also there's already a lot of rules and regulations on, on how to handle the data and the fines that those same rules apply to whether it's a manned or unmanned system. I just wonder: pictometry has limitations? You know, it can't film within so many feet of your house. It can't get a certain resolution. Are those kinds of things exist for that or for Google or for Zillow? I, I don't understand. Sometimes technology makes moves and advances over the air long, but our reasons 
Case of point here is uh, what if the next gen of the imagery that Google puts out on Google Maps yeah. actually allows you to detect faces? Yeah. So now it can do human identification. Maybe somebody in swimming pool or something up above. I mean, there, there's a case where the technology, you know, I'm not sure what kind of line they're going to cross. Yeah. And it's the other aspect, too, is you can go on the.net and you take a look at your tax map and then you can take a look at your earth and look at your house. And you can see your neighbor's house and yeah. you see who's got pools and got blue chips. <laughs> outlines of people walking around here and there. So it's already there. So whether it is, you know, is there a distinction between determining, you know, looking at that and outlining your property boundary versus finding out, you know, where the locusts are this year that's going to go eat my corn crop that could be something that, you know, potentially impacts. So well, I, I think one of the interesting things to investigate is going to be where is it appropriate to use that data versus local or you have a different set of, of sensitivities.